All righty, I think we are live. So thank you everyone for coming to join us. Um, really excited that you're all here. Um, hopefully everyone can hear us. If you can hear us, just put um, in the live chat. Um, give us a give us a moment. <laughs> Let me know if you can hear us in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good on this end uh, there, Natasha. All righty. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening um, or late this afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Jody Allaire. I'm the Director of Citizen Science and Community Engagement at Birds Canada. Uh, I'm here with Natasha Barlow, uh, who's our Boreal Program Coordinator. And uh, we've got a really fantastic about half hour of really diving into uh, Canada's boreal forest. Um, we're going to talk about what th this region means to birds, uh, some of the threats that the boreal forest faces, and, um, and have really a discussion about why the boreal is so important and why we should be paying attention to it. Um, we do have the chat box open on the YouTube page. So if you do have any questions, um, please put them there and we'll try to get those uh, at the end. If we don't get to your question uh, tonight, because we do have a lot to talk about, um, you will be able to email, uh, we'll, we'll follow up with you afterwards. And you can also email some of those in the questions uh, to Natasha at nbarlow at birdscanada.org and her email um, and links to a variety of things that Natasha is going to be talking about are in the comment box um, underneath the video. All right, so you can, you can check those out. Uh, so let's get started. So Natasha, take it away. Okay, so yeah, hi, I'm Natasha. Um, if you've been following along with the Birds Canada Instagram or Facebook stories or posts, you've probably seen my face a lot in the past 10 days. Um, but if not, welcome. Thank you so much for coming wherever you're coming from, maybe the Toronto Bird Celebration or um, yeah, wherever you're, you're coming in from, thanks so much for being here. Really excited to have this chat. So if you don't know me, I'm Natasha Barlow. I'm the Boreal Conservation Project Specialist at Birds Canada. If you aren't familiar with Birds Canada, we're uh, um, an environmental NGO and our mission is essentially to conserve wild birds through sound science, on the ground action, innovative partnerships, public engagement and science, excuse me, science-based advocacy. Um, and I was really intrigued by Birds Canada because I honestly didn't start birding until later in life. Well, not really later in life, but like <laughs> second year of my undergrad. I'm really Relative old. later in life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> later in life. <laughs> um, like second, second year of my undergrad, really, even though I grew up near Point Pelee National Park and definitely missed a world of birds, but that's okay. Um, but once I started birding and really getting outside and being aware of what's out there and the different abundances and the different diversity of species, it really intrigued me. And now I work for Birds Canada, um, which is really, really exciting. And that aside, today we're going to be focusing on this amazing region in Canada called the Boreal Region. All right. Um... Fantastic introduction. So let's jump right into the questions. Uh, I see we have about 30 people tuned in already. So that's fantastic. So Natasha, the first big obvious question, what exactly is the boreal region? Yeah, great question. So I am just going to, I know this isn't really supposed to be formal, but I'm just going to quickly show um, kind of a visual aid to help us um, um, direct our thinking. So what is the boreal region? The boreal region is one of the biggest biomes on earth. And a biome is essentially a region categorized by the many plants and animals that live there that have formed uh, community assemblages based on the different climate, the different physical attributes that are present there. So the map that I'm showing you, the grayscale are forest biomes in the world. And the source is adapted from Olson et al, 2001, 
again, as Jody said, you can look in our description below the YouTube video for various links um, and various journal articles that I'm going to be referencing throughout this. And again, if you don't have access to those articles, you can always email the corresponding authors for access. So that aside, you can view this map there. Um, but if you look at the green at the top, that's the boreal region. That is the region that we're talking about today. And the boreal region is an incredible region because it has 30% of all of the world's forest region. Um, it has more fresh water than any other biome on earth. It has large tracts of unmanaged forests, and it's really only spread a across like a few areas. You can see it's like the US, Canada, Scandinavia, Asia, that's about it. And Canada is obviously one of them. I'm gonna, just gonna switch the screen here. So this map shows, um, you can see the green area is the boreal region. And you can just visually see how much land area is taken up in Canada by the boreal region. And because we're one of the few countries really that has access to the boreal region, we have a really unique and a really important opportunity to protect this, this, this biome and protect this ecosystem and a really important and unique opportunity to actually experience it. So the boreal region, it's a high latitude environment and it's characterized by short growing seasons. Um, there's freezing temperatures, six to eight months of the year. There there might be some extreme conditions like plentiful snow or natural disturbances like fire, wind blowdowns, insect outbreaks. And although the boreal is, we call it a forest ecosystem, it's not just trees. It's composed of wetlands, lakes, rivers, mountains, shorelines. It's a variety of habitat. It's a plethora of habitat. Um, and it's really a safe space for so many species and it's such an intact biome still that it's really really important for um, a variety of different species so getting us thinking does anybody know why it's called the boreal like where does the name boreal come from so i'm gonna i know there's a delay between us and you guys so in the chat box type in your wildest i mean not wildest answers but why do you think it's called the boreal region full transparency I didn't know, I don't know, Jody. do you have an idea of why it's called the boreal region? <laughs> I do, because I read the show notes. Oh, well then we won't give a spoiler. We won't give the spoilers out. <laughs> but yeah, if anyone has any any thoughts, like what what do you think it's, it's being called? Anyway. Um, maybe while we're waiting for that, there is one question mm, that came up is. about the, yep. the map image saying it was yes. uh, from 2001. Has the boreal forest shrunk since that <laughs> image was made? Great, great question. Um, so yes, <laughs> um, if you, in there's a link in our bio and in, in the description, um, it's our story map from the Nature Conservancy of Canada and boreal and, and um, birds Canada. And you can go to that story map and if you scroll down to, I think it's a tab that's protect or, or changes in the boreal, you can actually see the intact forest landscape changing over time between, I think it was the year 2000 to 2016. Um, so you can actually go and see, at least in Canada, the boreal forest loss. But yes, this, this map is dated, um, but honestly, I couldn't find a great one. <laughs> so that's why this one is being used. It's still it's still relevant. It still gives you an idea, but definitely check out our story map. So there's been a few answers mm. um, to the question. Um, and the common theme here is North. Uh, does mm. Boreal mean North? And there are several people uh, that have uh, suggested that. So that, is, yeah. is that what it means? That is very close. Um, so it is actually known for the Greek God Boreas, which means God of the North wind. So very much like very appropriate. Um, god of winter, god of the north wind. And yeah, very appropriate for the extreme conditions that can be actually seen in the boreal or you think of the aurora borealis. Um, the root word boreal comes from the north wind and winter. So great ideas. Um, and even if you really don't live in the boreal region, there are still many different ways that we can make personal connections to interact with boreal wildlife at your home or in your natural areas. And right now, the boreal is being delivered literally to your doorstep through the wonder of birds. Okay, so let's go, let's go to our second question then. Why is this region important for birds and mm. what birds live in the boreal yeah. region? Great question. Um, so 
thousands, and I cannot stress, thousands of birds are traveling to like all of your viewers' neighborhoods right now at night in the sky. The boreal is Canada's bird nursery because there's over 300 bird species that breed here in the billions, like billions of individuals. The boreal is important for, we'll say groups of birds. Um, some are long distance migrants. They're neotropical migrants, meaning that they might be coming all the way from Venezuela in South America through your backyard to say the Northwest Territories or to the Newfoundland and Labrador. And you can actually, in our description, you can check out, it's called birdcast.info and there's live migration maps that you can check out. They are for the US, but it'll give you an idea of um, what, where in Canada you're going to be seeing that migration at night. Um, yeah, so I guess, Jody, a question for you. Have you had any long distance migrants in Western Canada show up coming through your neighborhood? Yeah, you know, and things are a little bit, a, a little bit different schedule here uh, mm -hmm. in Southern Alberta compared to, you know, the migration mainline through Southern Ontario and up the Eastern seaboard. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of, you know, boreal stuff that actually head West uh, across, mm -hmm. across Canada and some kind of go up the pipe. But here in, uh, in Southern Alberta, we've been getting quite a few black pole warblers and mm -hmm. the bird that's everyone's talking about on social media here uh, in Alberta and Calgary the past couple weeks is Swainson thrushes. There's been, it's like someone like tipped over a dump truck full of Swainson thrushes and it's like, they're everywhere. Like absolutely like more common than Robins in people's yards. And there's been a lot of people posting pictures um, and sharing that on social media. So it's been oh. a really great Swainson thrush year uh, for on migration. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know like black pole warblers, I think it was recorded by, I think the Norris lab at the university of Guelph, um, where they had one bird that went 20,000 kilometers annually for its migration, like such a long distance migration for such a tiny bird. So super, super cool. But it's not, again, like it's not just these long distance migrants. Um, there are these shorter distance migrants too like white-throated sparrow, for example, that use everyone's, probably everyone's neighborhood, um, whether you're in Southern BC, Ontario, or the Maritimes in the winter, um, you can see them come into your feeders. And these birds are shorter distance migrants that travel a little bit more north to the spring in the boreal and then come back south to like Southern Canada um, in, this, in the, the fall and winter. Um, and aside from migrants, um, there are also species that live there all year round. There are species that are adapted to these extreme conditions um, and they're there, they're residents like blackback woodpeckers, boreal owls, boreal chickadees and spruce grouse. Um, and then there's some species, a little back to migration that don't actually use the boreal for breeding. They might travel through the boreal region to breathe even more north. They might use it kind of as a stopover habitat or like a stepping stone, like red knots, these cute little shorebirds that are just like brilliant red that I've never seen, but I have heard that they are, are they, they can be found in these huge congregations. I don't know if you've seen it, but I have not seen it. And I would love, I would love to see like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of red knots, just like stop over in the boreal habitat, using it, fueling mm. up to continue on um, in their migratory path. Um, and these, all of these species, um, including ones that are at risk, um, we have whooping cranes. Canada's and North America's tallest bird are whooping cranes at 1.5 meters in height. And these, they are really at risk. They're really rare. Um, there's only about 600 individuals left, which is really small, but also a lot larger than the 20 birds that existed, existed in the 1940s. So there's a win-win there, um, but they, the migratory population of whooping cranes, they only breed in Northern Alberta and Southern, Southern Northwest territories. So if we lose that habitat, kind of concerning for species at risk as well. Um, and all of these species that, all these groupings of species I'll say that I've kind of talked about, they all have different habitat preferences. Like you and I, they have different preferences of what they like, whether it's colder or it's hotter, whether they like pizza or they don't, I don't know why, <laughs> but, or if you like swimming or if you like just hanging out in a hammock under the mm. shade, Everyone has different preferences and birds do too. And that's why the boreal with it's so much habitat with 
forests and wetlands and shorebirds and, and short coast coastlines. Spoiler, shorebirds use it too. Anything from shorebirds to ducks or warblers or kinglets or cranes, they can all find um, different habitat preferences there. And this, um, this mosaic of habitat is really, really vital to all these bird populations. But it's not just birds, like it's other species too. It's woodland caribou, which is threatened in Canada. It's special concern species like wolverine and wood bison. We have wood bison in Canada. Um, and the boreal toad. I didn't know, but there's a boreal toad mm -hmm. that is in Western Canada. It's not ex like exclusively boreal, but there's a boreal toad that uses just the, like the boreal region um, in Western Canada. So it's really, it really provides vital services for many, many, many different species. And that's why it's really important. So, and it's interesting and, you know, and I've learned more about this just from talking with you, mm -hmm. the boreal, I think there's the impression that the boreal is just a solid mat of, of forest, but it's, it's really not. There's actually a lot of wetlands within the boreal and a lot of those wetlands are the reason that we have the, the whooping crane or whooping crane. Mm -hmm. We'll have to talk about which, which is right. best, I don't know. Um, and uh, but wetlands play a really important part for those shorebirds and whooping cranes and and many of those animals as well non non forest animals. Yeah, totally. It's it's yeah a lot of it, it is like referred to as like a forest ecosystem, but about a third of the region is other things. It's mountains and coastlines and wetlands. Um, so it's not just trees. I mean, trees are obviously incredibly important, but there is a variety of habitat too, for sure. Okay, we, yeah. we should keep going to the next question. And I see there's some more questions coming up on the chat mm -hmm. here, and we'll try to get to some of those uh, at the end. So thank you for being, thank you mm -hmm. for being patient. Um, so uh, next question is, what are the, the major threats to the boreal region in Canada? Yeah, good question. Um, so there's different threats based on where you are in the boreal. If we're talking about the Southern boreal, um, the Southern boreal has undergone much more extensive development from forestry and mining to oil and gas. And it's not just the infrastructure, it's um, the transportation corridors, it's the building of power lines and roads that break up this habitat and fragment it. So the Southern Boreal has undergone much more extensive industrial development and urban development too. Um, but there is still a concern with um, that trend moving northward into the northern boreal, which has largely intact areas. Um, obviously, there's still some development, but um, primarily it's more of a concern of that increasing in development. And also climate change. Um, climate change is an interesting one because there's been a reported mean temperature increase of about 1.5 Celsius um, annually that's undergone in the global boreal biome. And the boreal biome is actually expected to be the hardest hit forest biome globally in regards to temperature changes. And again, um, this is all cited below. Um, you can check out those, those in the description box. Um, but these, these temperature changes, if we just do a little thought experiment, um, this could lead to changes in precipitation in the fire regime. Um, natural disturbances like fire are not uncommon in the boreal, but if you have an increased frequency of fire, if you have increased forestry operations, um, and the species that are more adapted to live in these colder environments, um, you know, you might end up seeing in extreme cases, parts of this region shifting to a more grassland or shrubland biome. And there are generally winners and losers when it comes to habitat change, species that prefer, say, less mature tree canopy cover or more open canopy and shorter shrubs like alder flycatcher or chipping sparrow. They might be the winners in this case. They might increase in abundance. But then other species um, like golden crown kinglets or Cape May warblers that prefer more old growth, mature, uh, mature trees, they might decrease in abundance. And those are kind of our losers when it comes to that habitat change. So even if there is a high abundance of some species in an area, we still have to remember that this might mean that that habitat is not ideal for other species, including some species at risk. And if we're continually reducing one type of habitat, there's gonna be nowhere left for these species to go. And this, is, like, this isn't just a concern in the boreal, but because it potentially will be the hardest hit in regards to temperature change, um, it's definitely something that I think we should be considering. Oh, absolutely. So are there threats to these migratory 
boreal birds outside of the boreal region that we should be paying attention to? Yeah, unsurprisingly, yes. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> just remember how we talked about um, some species that travel like thousands and thousands of kilometers. Like imagine you're 10 grams, you're the you're the weight of a loony and you're flying from South America to the boreal region. Now imagine if we walked there, like imagine if I walked from South America to Northern Ontario and then I walked back to South America, I would hope for clear skies and paved roads and like beautiful weather and maybe some free food and like a place to sleep. But imagine if I got back home and my home was gone, like you're mm. exhausted, you're tired and you're starving and you just want to go to sleep and your home is gone. Um, that's literally happening to many of these migratory species. Um, you, they're, yeah, they're traveling thousands of kilometers, they're doing a dangerous, arduous journey, and they're getting back to their southern overwintering grounds, and it's, the habitat is being reduced there. They're being cut down, the wetlands are being converted um, or contaminated to agriculture. Um, and if you were checking out some of our Instagram posts, if you looked at the rusty blackbird, which is highlighted, the rusty blackbird um, has experienced population declines of over 80% since yeah. the 1970s, and they overwinter in the southern U.S., and they rely on wooded wetlands throughout their entire life cycle. So when these wetlands are being converted, um, they're really reducing the available habitat for these species. Um, and so there's not many places left for them to go. So they go to the boreal, it's safe, safe there. They travel back south for the winter, it's not really safe there. Um, or if we think about the Canada warbler, like Birds Canada's logo, um, mm. they travel from Latin America to the boreal every year. And when it gets back to winter to Latin America, its forest might have been cut down because of coffee plantations. And again, there's nothing wrong with industry or coffee. It's just there are ways that um, we can promote more, we'll say, sustainable agriculture in ways that it can um, like cross promote habitat as well as coffee plantations or wetland conversion or wetlands and agriculture. So there's definitely threats um, in the boreal, but very much so in their southern overwintering grounds as well. So that's a that's a good transition to sort of the mm -hmm. last section that I think we should spend a chunk of time in. Mm -hmm. um, so what can you do to help these birds really regardless of, of where you live on the, yeah. on the landscape and and maybe a little bit about you know what birds canada is doing to try to help mm -hmm. yeah um yeah so for both like you and i jody and i who live not in the northern boreal and <laughs> on the boreal um i'm in eastern canada you're in eastern canada like what can we do and we're not in the boreal region um if you've been following our instagram stories or facebook stories you'd probably know by now that i live in an apartment in a city so like what nature am i going mm. to experience like what boreal nature am i going to experience here but at the same time if you saw my instagram story like a couple of days ago you would know that i had um, a special boreal bird visit my parking lot so if anyone remembers what that is, I'm just curious, um, just type it in the chat. If you remember what warbler species is a hint, I had outside my urban parking lot. So just, yeah, take time, put it in the chat. If you haven't seen it, I'll give you um, a hint. So I live in Southwestern Ontario. I saw a boreal breeding warbler um, on Saturday. I just went outside at 6 a.m. I went to the parking lot. I was going birding and then I heard this bird and I was like, oh, you're a boreal breeder and you're in my parking lot. So I'm just curious if anybody, if anybody, anybody has any guesses. <laughs> Yeah, no, nothing yet, but uh, yeah. but I, I do want to give a plug to the Birds Canada Instagram page. Yeah. If you haven't been there, there's a lot going on there with stories, and there's a great feature going on this weekend mm -hmm. um, on uh, photographing feeder birds in your backyard mm -hmm. with Missy Mandel, so she'll check that out. Um, and hey, we, got a, we have a correct Woo! response. <laughs> Bill, Bill Davis wow. uh, says Tennessee Warbler, right on, Amazing. Bill. Amazing, yes. Stuff. <laughs> Yeah, a Tennessee warbler. Um, and yeah, if you don't know what they sound like, also a plug, um, Justin Peter is doing a webinar tomorrow on birding by ear. So if you wanna learn about that, check that out on our Instagram too. But yes, a Tennessee warbler um, singing outside of my apartment just a few days ago. And they're almost exclusively a boreal breeder that's coming from South America. So uh, like these birds are literally being delivered 
to my doorstep in southwestern Ontario right now, like during this week, during the last week, during next week. Um, yeah. Have you seen any boreal birds like where you are in, in Alberta, like in your neighborhood? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the Swainson thrush, I, I actually yeah. added a new yard bird because my entire life is yard birds at the moment, <laughs> um, of which it's about 70 right now. So um, yeah, I actually added a gray cheek thrush in the yard uh, just a couple days ago. Um, which is, which is good. And we don't see a ton in Alberta coming through in the spring. I've had about three this year, which is interesting. So, um, yeah, that was, that's, that's a first yard bird for me. Great. great Um, and, uh, and I do want to give a shout out, uh, to Brenda here on the chat who also, uh, got Tennessee world. I may have missed that, but, but thanks Brenda. And thanks for all the questions, Brenda. And we'll try to get to those. Um, so, so let's talk about ways that people can Mm -hmm. help birds Mm -hmm. at home. Yeah, so I'm just going to share another slide. Um, just as I think it'll be useful just kind of as a list. Um, okay, so here you go. Ways to help. Um, so, <coughs> sorry. So our backyards can provide these migratory species and all resident species with safe spaces to either fuel up or breed. Um, and I can do this too as an apartment dweller. So some ways that you can help are listed on the screen. Um, gardening for birds and making your homes more bird friendly. And we're going to talk a little bit about this more um, as we go on, but how can we make our homes helpful and friendly for these birds that are traveling thousands of kilometers and are really tired? We can also do this through making um, different consumer choices. Again, going back to coffee and thinking about these different forest products. And then you can also join Birds Canada. Um, We'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, citizen science projects are really great ways to contribute to data collection, to do on the ground conservation for these boreal birds. But if we go ahead and look at gardening for birds. So when I feel like people hear gardening for birds, they Mm -hmm. think that they need to turn turn their entire property into a chaotic wild mess. Um, And it doesn't (laughs) have to be attractive, you know? That's what I feel like people Mm -hmm. hear. I feel like people who aren't millionaires and don't have like millions of acres to contribute solely to conservation are like, okay, well maybe, you know, it might not be beneficial, but I am not a millionaire and I live in an apartment and I do not have these expansive natural areas. But again, a Tennessee warbler didn't really care about that. Mm. So, I mean, obviously it'd be more ideal to have natural areas, but that aside, um, there are things we can do in our, in, our, in our home areas. We can still have grass, but maybe consider reducing your lawn area, maybe including ground cover, shrubs, taller trees to provide st- safe stopover habitat or safe breeding habitat for a variety of species. We're thinking about those habitat preference in a, preferences, excuse me, preferences again, um, habitat partitioning. Some species like to sing in the tall trees like Bullock's Oriole or Baltimore Oriole, wherever you are in, in Canada, or some species like to nest on the ground. Some species like to forage in the shrubs. So by providing this diversity of structural habitat, we can increase the diversity, increase um, the, the likelihood of really helping these species. Um, and maybe you want to include some plant species that provide food all year round. Maybe you can provide berry um, fruit bearing or berry bearing um, plants in the spring for your cedar wax wings and maybe you can do that in the winter for your pine grow speaks. Um, you can also supplement with bird feeders um, for those white-throated sparrows or your evening grow speaks or your boiled chickadees, purple finches, maybe you'll have a rough gross visit, who knows. Um, there is a, like you can supplement with bird feeders and this can be important in the winter, um, especially for these short distance migrants from the boreal that can actually refuel further overwintering in southern on uh, southern Ontario, southern BC, etc., and then go north a little bit more um, for the spring. And on the topic of feeders, um, it is also kind of important to talk about glass and window collisions because we need to be mindful of where we are putting our feeders because. Birds can't really perceive glass. Um, If there is a window and it's like perfectly clean, like I have a really tough time deciding if it's really glass too. Um, And if there's no railings, like watch out. Um, But so birds have this too. And imagine it's nighttime, it's raining, there's lights all over and you're trying to get like get home or get to your boreal breeding region and you're flying really fast. So we do have to be mindful of um, glass too. And there are different ways that we can reduce this at your home. So the bottom right shows the dots on the windows. That's um, 
pretty widely used. Um, there, again, there's links in the description below. You can check out um, how you can make your, your homes bird friendly. You can, maybe you have some etched glass, which is great um, on, on your doors to maybe break up that reflection a little bit. I know Jody, you were talking about um, doing like the Zen curtains, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I've been, I've been experimenting with a few of these as well at our new, at our new house. And I've been using paracord to put up uh, in a few areas to try it out. And I'll be doing some dots as well. But, uh, but yeah, some of these options, you know, cost a little bit more than mm -hmm. others. And the, the paracord option um, is actually really cheap and, uh, yeah. and, and, and seems to work quite well. So you don't have to spend an arm and a leg on, on some of these solutions, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like speaking about cheap, I have props, show and tell. So like I bought this Sharpie, it's like an oil based, it's not sponsored, but it's like, it's Sharpie, it's an oil based paint. Um, and the bottom left one shows you um, areas where you can just draw on the windows. This is actually mm. taken from the University of British Columbia. And this pen was like less than $20, I think. Mm. Um, so, and I'm planning on doing this on my apartment balcony. So something that we can do as apartment dwellers um, to kind of reduce collisions. Um, as long as like the, the lines are like less than five centimeters apart. And there are some stipulations there too. So obviously we have to do our research, but it's a really inexpensive option. Um, and it doesn't, doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be anything crazy. Um, yeah, so I'm literally making plans to do this right now. And another thing that I know we've probably talked about, um, you've probably heard before, but if you do have cats, um, please keep them indoors. It is safer for your cats for them to be indoors. It is also safer for literally everything else outside for your cats to be indoors too. Um, so yeah, thinking about the safety of the cats and also thinking about the safety of the wildlife is also um, something that um, we need to consider as well. Um, like imagine walking from Winnipeg to Northern Manitoba and then you're tired and you just want to stop at a diner, but before you get there, like a cougar comes and eats you, you know, like that wouldn't be, that's not ideal for anybody. So it's not a deal for birds too. Um, so, you know, something to keep in mind. So um, I think Natasha, I think what's interesting here, right. Is that these ways of keeping your yard bird friendly. I think a lot of people think of these as, you know, what you can do for the birds that are in your yard, yeah. you know, whether that's the house wrens or the house sparrows or the cardinals, if you live out East or blue yeah. jays out here. Um, but in fact, the, the impact is double. It's, it's good for the birds that mm -hmm. are year round at your house, but it's really important for these boreal migrants that are mm -hmm. coming through. Right. So that's, uh, exactly. it is, I think people don't think about migratory birds when they're thinking of doing these things to their houses, but they, but they should, cause it is an important element. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it's not just the, you know, naturalized, but invasive house sparrows like it is migratory migratory species too that that can be influenced by this especially when they're exhausted and they're like on the ground um so yeah. something to think about um so those are kind of like the direct ways that we can influence bird populations but there are some more indirect ways too and that's where these consumer consumer choices come in um so we can choose to buy if you're a coffee drinker there is something called the smithsonian certified coffee that works with different coffee plantations that have worked really hard to incorporate natural habitat into their coffee plantations um i know again throwing it back to you jody but i know that you just had a fun beautifully colored bird visit your backyard that travels potentially to south America and potentially to these coffee plantations in the winter. Uh, yeah, uh, well, a couple, right? But right. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, like Western Western Tanager here um, at a male Western Tanager uh, while I was on a work Zoom meeting. Oh, I was there, <laughs> right outside the window, right, and it was in the bushes. Uh, it was in the service berries, uh, which is a fantastic yard plant, it, like right outside the window. And you know, it was there for the day. Got a few nice photos and got it all over my eBird checklist and, and that was it, you know, and it was, it was pretty cool. You know, it's a very satisfying thing to be able to have those things planted in your yard and for have it be useful for, for these, for a migrant like Western Tanager, which is, you know, retina burning gorgeous, right? Like you could damage your eyes if you stare at Western Tanagers <laughs> just too long. They're really in, incredible. Um, yeah. Natasha, I have a comment here uh, from mm. Steph Davis saying, uh, Steph says uh, she made the paracord blinds. Cool. Uh, she used the mm -hmm. pattern from the Ecopian Bird Savers page. That's yep. right. That's where I got my uh, my design as well. And mm -hmm. she said they work great. Also, um, awesome. Glad so to hear it. Good. Yeah, excellent. Glad to Thank hear you it. for sharing that. 
Yes. Thank you. Yeah. It's always great to see. Um, I know there's like, it's, it's hard to, to figure out what works best, but, um, it's, it's useful to try for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So Western Tanager, beautiful bird travels, um, longer distance migrant can travel down south to those coffee plantations, which is great. Um, and we can also, also indirectly help, um, not just with, um, like coffee choices, but if like paper choices, lumber product choices too. I have another prop. I don't know if you can see it, but it's like, it says FSC. So that's a certification. It's called the Forest Stewardship Council Certification. Again, linked below in our description where um, the Forest Stewardship Council really holds the forestry industry to a higher standard um, of sustainability. So purchasing products with that logo on it can help birds, um, whether it's in the boreal or otherwise, um, it can really, really indirectly help um, reduce deforestation and really just all wildlife. It's not just, just boreal birds. Um, so there are a lot of things that we can do, whether we live in their breeding range, whether, whether we live in their migratory range or whether we live in their overwintering range. There are a lot of direct and indirect things that we can personally do um, to help these birds. And the last thing is um, for Birds Canada, we've um, I mean, obviously we're, we're an organization, we're branded as Birds Canada, we care about birds. And we've been working to advance conservation on the ground for birds for over 60 years. This is like boreal birds too, um, through many, many data-driven products and projects. And some of them are citizen science projects. Some of them are, are collecting, some citizen science are collecting data for us to actually conserve boreal species and many species on the ground. So I want to give a shout out to any citizen scientists that are here that have ever participated in any of Birds Canada's programs. Thank you so much. Like genuinely, thank you. It is, we really like birds cannot do it without you. We cannot do it without you. So it's really, really helpful. And if you want to become a citizen scientist, I know it might sound a little scary, like scientist. It's not. If you have a bird feeder and mm -hmm. you're in the winter and you see a white-throated sparrow, you can join Project Feeder Watch and you can record these winter bird abundances, some of them being boreal breeders, mm -hmm. um, to help kind of track um, boreal birds throughout their life cycle, specifically in the winter. Um, maybe you're on eBird, maybe you participated in the nocturnal owl surveys. We have a database that talks about, uh, that, has, that has a lot of sightings of boreal owl, these like tiny little boreal owls that again, I've never seen because I'm not the best birder. Um, but a lot of data can be collected that way that can again, help on the ground conservation. Um, if you've done province-wide bird survey is called atlases or if you're interested in doing it like Newfoundland is running an atlas for the next five years and Newfoundland Labrador is essentially a 100% boreal province yeah, so right. there is many different ways that like we can personally contribute um, and if you want to be involved with just data data science just looking outside and you're like oh there's a white throated sparrow you can join project feeder watch and that would that would be super helpful and again all of that is in the link in our description um for the birds canada website and you can kind of go from there so yeah there's a lot of things that we can do and the borough region is great and i hope you all get a chance to experience it yeah ab absolutely i second that it it's it you know, outside of the, the conservation significance of the mm -hmm. boreal, all the amazing things that are there, it's it's a stunning it's a stunning part of our country, and I think it's it's an area that Canada has a lot of ownership and leadership mm -hmm. on. You know, the boreal is, is it really encompasses a lot of our vast country. Um, yeah. So if you haven't spent time uh, traveling in the boreal, you know, I highly I highly recommend it. Um, mm -hmm. As someone who has lived there for several years, uh, the boreal is is just a stunning place. Um, so thanks very much for all that, Natasha. There's a yeah. lot, a lot to unpack here, and and I'll just repeat again. Um, a lot of the whether it's papers being referenced or links to some of the things that Natasha was talking about, they are in the show notes. They are in the comments on the YouTube page. So feel free to go and take a deep dive into some of those if you want some more information. Um, we do have a few questions, so maybe we'll just take about two minutes well, here to deal mm -hmm. with questions, and then and then we'll wrap it up. And as I said before, if people have questions after this is over, please feel free to email uh, Natasha. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, okay. So, um, so the so uh, Brenda had several questions here. Oh, I'm, sorry, thank Brenda, you. I'm not sure going to get to all of them. 
Um, I can answer the one, why is there no BirdCast for Canada? Yes, we need that up here. Um, and that would be great to have someday, <laughs> but we'll just have to leave it at that. Um, she had a question about why some warblers uh, nest south of the boreal while other warblers nest fully into mm -hmm. the boreal. Um, did you want to take a stab at that one, Natasha? Or? Yeah, sure. We can both kind of talk about it. Um, yeah. So if we're thinking about, again, like habitat partitioning, um, and if we want to, so birds have it harder than humans um, when it comes to competition and when it comes to um, niche partitioning, we call it, where they have kind of their, their, their habitat preferences and what they like um, and what they can actually have evolved to exist in. So if every single species existed within one like like southern shrubland habitat with one type of insect then there would not be enough insects for all the birds and there would not be enough habitat for all the birds to nest in and provide for their young and set up different breeding territories so different bird species um, it's kind of why you see a lot of diversity all over the globe and why i don't have like we don't have the same species here in ontario that jody does in alberta so different species have evolved to um, adapt with this specific environment and to reduce competition reduce predation um yeah so that's that's kind of why you can see different species in different areas yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And uh, I think, you know, there are some boreal specialist, you know, warblers, but you can still find them on the periphery of their range, right? You know, bay-breasted warbler, uh, Cape May warbler, you know, a couple examples there. Um, and they their populations kind of ebb and flow with things like spruce budworm mm -hmm. um, in, in the boreal. Um, so it's not, it's not as that super static. There's not like a hard line there, but certainly when you get into the boreal, you know, your, your species abundance of, of warblers really goes up um, because there's a lot, there's a lot of species that rely on that, on that type of habitat. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we'll just get one last question. Oh, yeah, so there's another one from Brenda about uh, why red knots avoid uh, breeding in the boreal. Um, and, you know, I can answer that one. You know, red knots are a high Arctic nesting shorebird species. So they're really just traveling through, you know, they're going from Tierra del Fuego you know, in South America, and they're going right up to the high Arctic. They're, they're a major super migrant, and they're also uh, a, a major species at risk, a species that's declined significantly, mm -hmm. uh, really significantly. It's, it's quite shocking uh, with red knot population. So that's a species that uh, the high Arctic, you know, habitat loss in the high Arctic could be an issue down the road. They have challenges on migration. Um, and yes, they will make stops along the way and that, and that could include the boreal, but that's a special treat to get to see those big flocks of, yeah. of red knots. I have been able to see a few of those in, in, in my time. At Long Point, I've been able to see a few flocks uh, early morning, probably coming in from the Eastern seaboard and just cruising right over uh, Southern Ontario, headed, probably heading up to James Bay, you know? Uh, yeah. Um, they are really impressive super migrants. Um, okay, I think, we're gonna, I think we're gonna wrap it up there. So. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to everyone that tuned in, um, that put your questions in the chat box. Thank you so much. Uh, some familiar faces there, which is great. And thank you, Natasha, for telling us about this amazing place and, and what we can do to help it. Awesome. Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I hope everyone's gotten something out of this. I hope you've at least, I've learned something new. Um, I, yeah, really happy about, um, I think Steph Davis has something about um, the, the windows. So that's great. Learn something new. Um, I'm glad that everyone tuned in. And again, check out those descriptions. Um, those links in the descriptions. I think I'm also going to add another one that's not there yet about um, a program that Birds Canada runs called MODIS that kind of tracks. I think there's um, a red knot example that you can check out to see some birds that have actually traveled that long distance. Um, so be sure to check that out after, after this is done. And I look forward to getting your questions at nbarlow at birdscanada.org. Again, you can find it in the description. So send me, send me, look, send me questions there. <laughs>